Can you hear me? Hello everyone, my name is Chris Liebing. I'm a DJ and producer from uh, Frankfurt here in Germany. Um, Antelope Audio asked me to do a Q&A session and a DJ set. Um, I'm super happy they invited me as I really love this company. I visited them in Sofia and uh, was able to see everything. Um, in light of the current circumstances, uh, I decided not to do a, a live set tonight. I guess, uh, as all of you are, I'm appalled of what is happening in the United States. Uh, uh, the racial injustice and the police brutality uh, needs to stop. And uh, I will do a DJ live set um, uh, this coming Saturday again. Uh, out of this place here. This is uh, the Rave Cave, basically. And this Saturday, I will dedicate this live set um, to uh, help the causes of Black Lives Matter and other uh, organizations just like that. Um, so tune in on Saturday for the music part, and um, we'll do the Q&A part here now. Um, I'm going to monitor the Facebook comments. You can hear me. I'll see that here because I have my iPad standing here with the YouTube. Um, good to see that you. Good to see that you are hearing me. I'm going to monitor the comments here and the comments on Facebook if I find it. That is, uh, I will at some point. But Antelope Audio has provided me already with some of your questions. I printed them down, and um, I would say we uh, dive right in and start. So the first question that has been asked was, how do you manage the excess in music these days, and how do you handle periods with lack of inspiration? Um, I guess I'll be saying that a lot uh, during this Q&A, because I already know, the, obviously, the, uh, the other questions. Um, the first rule for me is always do not stress out. Um, especially uh, these days, as the question is saying, um, the amount of music that ha is released is huge. And there is no way you can stay on top of everything that is coming out. Um, this was totally different, obviously, like 20, 25 years ago. Um, we used to have one or two record stores where we were going to uh, basically discuss the latest releases and there were basically maybe 150, 200 and then growing number of releases each week. Um, but the person in the record store usually had a good overview. He knew what you were listening to. Um, he knew what you were playing. So you had a pre-selecting uh, going on, pre-selection going on. This has totally changed, obviously. Now you get bombarded with promos. You have 
various platforms to uh, download music from. Um, so I have learned over the years to not stress. Um, go with the flow. Take it easy. Um, I'm a strong believer that the right tracks will always make its way to your ear. Um, obviously, you need to keep looking out for them. Obviously, you need to have an open ear for that. Um, but instead of stressing out and, and going on all those platforms and trying to uh, find the right music uh, for my DJ sets, let's put it that way, um, I try to focus on one platform, go through some stuff, as long as I feel good about it, as long as there's some uh, something is happening musically with me, you know, it's like I see there's some new tracks that are going this direction, what I'm looking for. So I keep searching and I do that as long as I kind of feel good about it. That's kind of a gut feeling. And then I, you go to the next platform. Um, then I go to my emails and I start downloading uh, from various uh, promo um, uh, companies that I have subscribed to and uh, check out what's going on there. Um, but try to get rid of the feeling that you're missing out um, because this is going to just worry you. You're just going to be um, sitting there and stressing yourself while, you're listening, while listening to music. You probably sit there listen, thinking, oh, I need to check this, I need to check this. Focus on the one thing that you're doing. Do not feel you're missing out on music. I've been doing this for 20, 25 years now. Uh, I'm sure a lot of tracks have passed me without me noticing but that is what's happening. Get used to it. Um, but the less you worry about that, the more you're open for the music that comes in. So that is my first question, uh, my first answer to that question. Uh, let me let me uh, quickly have a look at your comments. Uh, do you play MP threes, WAV, or WAV files? Alex Powell is asking that. Um, Hello, Argentina, by the way. Uh, that is an additional question. It's not on my list, but Alex was just asking that. And it's, it's another controversial one. Uh, I've started playing digital files in the early 2000s, where hard disk space was not really all that available yet. So I've started to work with MP3s in a format 320k bit um, encoding. Um, this is not my studio. I have to explain to you a little bit. This is actually not my studio. This is just uh, a room where I got stuck when it's in my apartment when when the virus uh, uh, lockdown started to happen. Um, I'm currently building a studio which is right below me here, but it's it's a it's a construction site. So I basically set everything up that I uh, that I had around me to work as good as I could um, with. Uh, uh, obviously machines you will see some of them later there's there's a little bit over there um, and I set up a, um, a place to work in and to broadcast from uh, so I do my DJ streams as well from here I have various cameras set up I'll show you later anyways um, getting back to to the mp3 question why I'm saying this uh, before I moved out of my old studio where I was probably in there for like 12 years, I knew the sound really well. Um, my speaker setup is a PMC MV2 setup, which some of you may know is, is a very linear, very detailed uh, loudspeaker. Uh, I've done various tests. I've done blind tests. I've done millions of tests. If you compare a WAV file, 44.1 kilohertz, um, with an MP3 320, and now I know you're going to pile up on me. Um, you're not going to hear that much of a difference. The differences are in, in the details. Um, yet those details get lost in clubs anyways. Uh, obviously, there's a whole chain which is going to make some bad sound not sounding much better in that chain. But I have learned that 320k bit is enough to play. It's good enough. It saves you uh, uh, quite some space. And uh, not, well, these days you have these little two terabyte disks. So wave files are not an issue. But if you have enough space, go for wave files. Now I don't really look at it anymore, but my minimum has to be 320. So that was one question from there. Um, 
Let's get back to the production side. Uh, next question. What are the main differences when starting a track project between now and 10 years ago? Uh, I would like to um, broaden that question a little bit, not only 10 years ago, maybe 15 or 20 years ago. Um, it's about starting a track project. Uh, these days, obviously, with technology has having advanced in the past 10, 15 years, you have loads of possibilities to, to start a project and a track. Uh, and there's another question coming up later on, which, which touches that issue too. But I can already tell you, um, never have just one routine of how you start to work on something. Back in the early days, end of the 90s, beginning of the 2000s, when we were sitting in the studios, um, we usually would just have a kick drum running and then just look around at our machines and just play with something and, and work on something. Or uh, I would have an idea of some other tracks which, which inspires me to do something similar um, to go into this direction. Um, that used to be the way, generally, and that is still the way that I work on it today. Yet today, I would say, I'm not starting with a kick drum again every time. Don't do that. Like Sometimes it leads to something, sometimes it doesn't. Um, if it leads to something, good, do it. Start with a kick drum. But technology gives us so many more um, uh, uh, possibilities to start a track. You can just make a noise, record it really quickly. You just open a new plugin and you play around with it. You, you capture a little loop of it. You, you loop it and you, you see where it takes you. Um, so I think the possibilities to start a track or a project these days is way, way bigger. And that is a nice thing. Um, uh, let's jump to this next question, which um, is basically part of that question. How do you like to start your tracks? And again, I would say, um, do not have a routine. Do you not do not have the same way to do something over again? Because you lose creativity over that course. Um, try something different. Uh, if you don't feel like having a four kicks running in, 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 a, in a loop and, and you're trying to come up with something in the meantime, just turn off the kicks, um, get rid of the idea that it has to be some certain thing and just work on some sounds. Um, do different approaches each time. If approach works for you, use it, go for it until you feel like the approach is not working for you anymore. And then change it. Maybe just take a recorder, take your phone, go outside, record some sounds, go back inside, record a vocal while you're cooking in the kitchen. Um, go back, sample that sound, loop it, do something with it. There is a million ways how you can start a track. Um, have you ever wanted to take a completely different musical direction style-wise? Yes, I've always, always, always wanted that. Um, uh, I always felt like that I started producing techno music because it was sort of easier to do than... I've never learned an instrument in my life, so it was easier to do than only like sitting down and learn how to play the guitar. Or learn. It was, it was, you had results quicker. You had your... Um, you had your... Uh, 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 synthesizers and you just played around with them and when it's something sounded good you just looped it and you 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 put it on your desk and you played around with it I really like that approach because I'm not a trained musician um, and I taught basically everything I know I basically taught myself or I was looking at professionals how to do that and I still do this a lot because uh, uh, the great day uh, the great times we're living in now you have YouTube you have various channels where you can have tutorials for everything. Uh, back in the days, in the late 90s, early 2000s, you just basically had to talk to friends and uh, visit other people in the studio. Um, so I started doing electronic music because it just was... Um, I, 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 I DJed dance music in general since the beginning of the 90s, so it was close to me sound-wise, and I could do it without having any... Uh, 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 musical training in, in a way. 
but yet I always felt like I want to express myself differently musically, um, in a in a more musical way. Uh, so uh, I did, and I teamed up with a really old good friend of mine and a really amazing producer called Ralf Hildenbeutel, uh, who partly formed the sound of Frankfurt in the very early '90s. Uh, he's a brilliant musician, and um, I knew if I wanted to venture out and do some different musical style direction, I, I had to ask him for help. And uh, that's what I did. And that's when we started working on my album Burn Slow. Oh, right there. Um, which was released on uh, Mute Records in uh, September 2018. Uh, and uh, it's more like a listening album, although it is it has some sort of danceable tracks on there. I'm currently actually working on uh, remixing this whole album into club tracks. I'm using the time sitting at home to do this. Um, uh, so expect a Burn Slow Club album. But I'm always uh, already at the same time working on the next album for Mute, which is also not a dance club album. It's more a listening album. Um, but you'll, you'll hear. So yes, the quick, <laughs> I guess the quick answer was like, to that question was yes. Please give me some comments if I'm ans answering these questions way too long. Hold on. I first enter enters these, and then I get back to to you on the on the chat. Uh, next question: How do you generate new ideas? Do you just play around with your gear, or you have a sound you're after from the beginning? Uh, chimes in a little bit with the question early on, how, does you, how do you start tracks? Uh, always try to go different ways. Um, I a lot of times have a groove in my head. I kind of hear the bass drum, I hear the bass, and I hear some percussions going on. And I'm trying to recreate that. Um, everything else that comes, comes from rather, I would say, the outside. You play around with a synth, um, and you'll find something appalling, uh, appealing to you, and you, you just continue to work on it. If you have too much of a set idea, maybe for some people that works, it doesn't work for me, uh, uh, because maybe my ability to uh, transport an idea out of my head onto uh, a desk, a mixing desk, or into the uh, DAW of the computer, um, Maybe my ability is just not good enough, so I can't do that. So I have to work the other way around. I'm trying to find things um, that I like, and I try to put them together in a way that makes sense for me. Um, and that, again, is this amazing thing with electronic music and producing electronic music. There is literally no rules. There is no rule. You can do whatever you want. You can really do whatever you want. Try every different approach that kind of helps you out. Um... What's your favorite part of making a track? Uh, essentially, all parts are kind of like great parts. Uh, the beginning is always interesting. Um, uh, either, I mean, both ways. Even if we spark, uh, speak about remixes or original productions, um, the beginning is always really interesting because you start to form an idea and you kind of have an idea where you want to take it. And then you start taking it to that idea. You have to be open to divert from your idea because maybe you have a better idea on the way. Um, uh, so these are all really, really interesting parts of, 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 of music production. Uh, the beginning production where you find your parts, where you find the idea, where you fine tune the idea. Uh, the next part where you're already starting to arrange a little. Um, the arranging usually comes with the producing. Um, that is really a natural way to do it somehow. Obviously, you can first produce loops and then start to arrange them. But I found for myself that uh, I, I am already kind of arranging tracks while I'm starting to produce them. So I kind of already feel like where sound needs to come in and I let it come in. And I, I also, especially with my setup now, which is really limited uh, in, in a way, uh, I... Uh, uh, I, I do long takes 
I, I kind of do a long take how I feel like this sound should evolve. Maybe even the percussions, a hi-hat, a ride or something like this, played from the 909. You just uh, let it evolve and play around with it. Obviously, you can cut pieces together and make them fit in the later, later on, but you already get a kind of an idea of, of where the arrangement is going. Um, but the question was, what is my favorite part? And my favorite part is usually the mix down. Um, the mix down, I just love mixing down stuff. I'm kind of a sound fanatic. Um, and once you're starting to mix down, you already kind of have this full on track li lying in front of you, which you're just forming into something bigger and better. And not only to make it sound better, to also get the vibe of the whole track across to the listener in a better way. So the mixing down is essentially my favorite part. Um, I was jumping a question, so I need to go back to where. Uh, do you prefer working alone or with someone else? I prefer both. Uh, it is amazing to collaborate with people. Uh, as I just told you, Ralf Hildenbeutel is one of my uh, all-time heroes in production, and he uh, agreed to sit with me in the studio over the past five years already. Uh, his studio is literally just like five minutes away from mine here. Um, we haven't been sitting together in the studio for the past three months, but we've, we're working on the next album together uh, as his input is absolutely essential for what I'm trying to express in a musical way when it comes to, the, uh, when it comes to my releases on Mute Records. Uh, so this is a lot of fun because I get to learn so much of, this, uh, of, of, of the other person. You, you watch him work and you learn a lot. Uh, I have also produced a lot and spent a lot of time together with Speedy J in the studio. Um, an absolutely fantastic producer and a genius uh, uh, in, in his way of how he approaches music. Um, not a trained music musician uh, himself, but an extremely um, knowledgeable person about anything related to electronic music from the very early 70s, I believe. Um, and sitting with him in the studio is mind blowing too, and you just learn so much. And I'm 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 feeling very blessed to be able to be sitting with these kinds of people together in the studio, uh, and learn and work. But I also love to work alone. I love sitting. Uh, as I'm a night person somehow, so I do like to sit in front of that screen behind me. Uh, lately, kind of when the night starts it's getting quiet out there the phone doesn't ring anymore nobody sends any whatsapp messages or something like this and you can totally dive into your project um th these are the times where i feel basically most comfortable as well it's just like nobody tells you anything what you need to do um uh, you can dive in you can do crazy experiments without having to explain it to anyone you can go really crazy stupid ways without feeling ashamed of yourself that you can't do it um, so it's, it's kind of both ways, which is the amazing thing with, uh, with, uh, with electronic music. Uh, obviously I didn't touch the subject of collaborations, but collaborations are a great thing too, because you just, you just compromise on sounds and you compromise on something, but that's a whole other uh, uh, topic. Um, one more question, which then takes me to my setup that I'm using. Can you explain your signal flow with Antelope when you do a DJ set? And let me tell you first one thing, and this is not because I'm doing the Q&A for Antelope Audio. I've been working with uh, sound interfaces <laughs> basically since, since, since I've been doing music, I believe. And I've, I've been using quite a lot of amazing sound interfaces uh, of, of loads of different brands. Uh, but I, I seriously have to tell you when Antelope Audio came into my life, uh, especially here with the Orion 32 Plus um, that, I'm, that I'm using uh, in my setup. I'm going to switch the cameras in a second so I can show you. Um, well, why not do now? You don't have to look at me. So I'll quickly switch over to another microphone in case you can... Can you still hear me on this one? Right. So I switch over to another microphone and I show you something here. So we're here now. Um, this is my MacBook Air 
and yes, I'm using a MacBook Air uh, from 2017 um, because it's, it's a machine that works. It easily handles my tractor software that runs on it and my machinist software that runs on it, which is, sorry, wrong button, which is right here, the machine. So this beautiful thing down here, which you see right there, this is my um, Antelope Audio Orion 32 Plus. It is the first sound card that I've ever had in my life that has never, seriously never failed on me. And I've been touring with this sound card, um, I believe now for four or five years. It has never failed me. At, any single gig that is just completely insane and i used to be a guy who was totally scared of having uh his setup um let me let me talk to you here right there um and i i'm i'm scared i like this these are my my nightmares when i wake up in the middle of the night thinking that you're playing in front of like 5,000 people at a super amazing event everybody's going mental and it's just everything just shuts off uh, because your sound card is dying, because your computer is dying, because something is dying. It always can happen, but these are my worst nightmares. And I have to say things to Antelope Audio, and I'm seriously not saying that because I'm here on that platform or something like this. It has never happened to me since I've been using this sound card. It has rarely happened to me before, I have to say, because I've always been very careful. I've always been traveling with two laptops, even having two laptops running, uh, two sound cards running, mixing these things together. People were used to ask me, why do you have two laptops? Well, because one fails and can continue to play on the other one. It, it rarely happened because I'm pretty, pretty good with my stuff, with my equipment. Um, uh, but with Antelope Audio, I actually switched to one laptop because I got so uh, so confident in in using this uh, that uh, uh, I, I was able to just let go of that fear that it fails on me. Um, uh, that is the one thing. And the other thing is, uh, all the sound cards I've used before compared to this one, um, sound-wise, couldn't keep up. Um, the clarity uh, of this sound card uh, and the depth is uh, unbeatable, I believe. It's, it's, it's pretty insane. And I'm sure some of you probably have this sound card at home because that's why you're watching and you totally agree with me. The way I'm using it, um, because that is essentially the question, the sound card is connected via sub D25 cables, which are right here, you see them right here. I have three sub D25 cables. Um, this is a Model 1 mixer from Play Differently. Um, and uh, the beauty of the Model 1 mixer is that it has sub D25 cables. Um, they're balanced cables. Uh, it's, it's, again, um, a, a lot of advantages, not only sound-wise, also uh, with the stability and you just don't have to deal with that many cables. So I'm going in and out with three sub D25 cables, um, which provide a perfect uh, audio flow, uh, going into this mixer and going out of the mixer, uh, which means I'm essentially, on a, for those geeks out there, I wrote my in and outs down. Um, I use four stereo outputs for my tractor, which has, uh, do I have, do I have a camera which actually shows my computer? I guess not. Um, <laughs> hold on, maybe this one? Yeah, this one. This one does, good, that's a new one. So here's my uh, computer with uh, four decks, each deck, two channels, essentially going into, um, where are we here? Going into these four channels, right here. Uh, that is the one part. But I have the machine connected as well, obviously, to my computer. Um, the machine software is also running, but I also, I'm not only using the machine for uh, special sounds, like uh, percussions mostly. Here we go. 
I guess, I guess, I guess you can hear that, right? Let me play around with it. A little ride. So I have loads of things on the machine running, which basically goes into this channel. And um, as well, I have sent and return channels in the machine. Um, my machine ins and outs are 0, 1, 2, 3, which goes into the machine. This is where I'm sending stuff to the machine. I have two send and returns on my mixer. So if I'm sending on my return 2, uh, on my aux 2, it, come back, it comes back on my return 2 and it's like, a, as you can hear, a reverb, a little reverb. And I have a delay as well on here. Well, that's, that's probably not the best signal to send a delay to, but you get the idea. So I go basically in and out of the Antelope um, uh, using the machine software to, for effects, which I'm using a reverb and a delay on my uh, send and returns. Uh, did, what did I forget? Uh, I guess that is how I connect. Yeah, this is how I connect my... Let me come back here. Let me go back to my... I'm not sure which one is better. Um, this is basically how I connect my uh, Antelope audio. And did I rave enough about the fact how... Uh, how... Uh, stable that thing is and how well it sounds. Um, what I wanted to additionally mention, because I thought of it early on when I read all those questions about like, how do I stay on top of all the music that's been released? And uh, I think I missed one question. Um, maybe I didn't print it, but wasn't there a question? I think I didn't print it, but I think there was a question how I deal with uh, a lack of inspiration. Oh no, that was the first question. Um, you always have a lack of, con of, of inspiration. There, there's always the moment coming where you don't have any inspiration. And again there, what I've learned is like, do not stress yourself and don't force anything. If you're starting to force something, you might learn something technically, but you're gonna burn yourself out because you're trying to do something which is not happening at the moment. Um, trust your instincts. If you feel like you're not inspired, maybe go for a walk. If you still feel, don't feel inspired, go for a longer walk. Um, if you still don't feel inspired, come back home. Take some records, listen to records, uh, listen to some completely different music. Lean back, get your mind off things. Do not stress about a lack of inspiration because a lack of inspiration is necessary to have inspiration again. So even the lack is as important as the inspiration itself. And once you kind of like digest that, you kind of like easy when you're, you're not stressing out. You're not feeling like, oh my God, I'm not good enough. I can't do anything. No, it's totally normal. Just chill and, 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 and take it easy. Um, so now I'm gonna start and try and read some questions. Maybe I'll play some music for you while I'm reading questions and until I find one that I want to answer. By the way, what's running now? There's a sneaky promotion in it's the Anna remix of my track trilogy um, that the original track was released on my Burn Slow album on you. So that's the Anna remix. It's just released last week. Um, Nico, Nico Masnovo is asking, Hi Chris, do you feel that there are certain times that you can't find any good tracks or that there are lots of good tracks with really bad parts? Yeah, um, there is like, we go through phases. When I look back in the last 20 years, uh, what music is, re is being released, you know, what style is hip, um, you go through phases where there's sometimes not you don't really find much good music and then there's times where it's just like whoa uh you have like 10 20 new tracks to play every weekend um again there it's just what is you know you 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 cannot control this so you you go through this 
Um, the great thing about tracks that are good but have really cheesy and stupid parts, make edits. Um, and that is my, my uh, um, suggestion to anyone who wants to start producing music anyways. Start making, uh, making music by making edits of tracks that you like, that you know. Turn them into something different. Uh, slowly start adding some stuff to it maybe. Um, if you start working with edits, you, you understand musical flow much better and what the track needs and what it doesn't need because you just kick stuff out. So if there's an amazing track which has a shitty part, I'll just edit it out. Um, if I'm too lazy to do that, the amazing thing is with the setup that I'm using with those four decks and the machine, and currently I also have, uh, not the 808, but I have the, oops, I have the 909 connected, so if I can show you that, I should really not jump back and forth with my microphones. You can hear me here now, um, but I want to show you that setup, which is, I've also connected a 303 and a 909 to my workflow. Um, so if, if there's a track that only has a pretty good groove, I'll just use the groove and I'll add some other stuff with it. Um, how about we try this now? Um, let's see. This is not, this is not planned now. You're up there. This is not planned now. I'm trying something. Uh, I did a, I did a 303 line for one of the remixes that I've been doing. So let's, uh, let's just throw it in there. Um, let's just, uh, add some rights on top. Yeah. I guess you can hear that. Can you still hear me while I'm talking? I have no idea. <laughs> can you tell me? Um, all right. Effects. Thing is, I don't really hear anything because I have my sound system really low, so I'm not sure what I'm actually doing here right now. Um, there you are. So I'm not sure what I'm actually doing here right now, but uh, uh, maybe I should turn it down so you can hear me. Uh, so this gives me so many possibilities. Um, and essentially, I've set this up to do my live streams um, uh, with a 909, 303, so I have enough stuff to play around with. Um, and if I want to use this over there, because this is my production computer over there, um, and then I'm just like moving this over there. It's all about comfort and having things easy accessible, um, not having to wire up stuff. I mean, excuse, by the way, excuse the mess behind me and excuse the, 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 the wiring mess here everywhere. Um, it's just a working space, basically. And uh, this is how you should treat it. Uh, I, I got some deliveries today. That's why it looks like uh, uh, pretty much uh, like a mess behind me. So that's better. Uh, all right, back to some more questions. I'm not really entirely sure how long I'm supposed to do this here, but as long as you ask me some questions, I will check them. So that's one part deconstruct your music, deconstruct tracks, do anything with it that you want to do with it. Um, you can still hear me. Do you actually hear me better on that microphone? Or I should have checked that way before. On this microphone. <laughs> I'm not sure. I leave it with this one now because I'm sure you're going to hear me with this one. Um, Again, it's, it's about taking pieces out of tracks, looping them, adding some new pieces. There's no rules. It's just you dive into, and that's, and that's how you can use tracks as well. <laughs> I think that was the original question. <laughs> that only have a, one tiny little good part in it. Just use the tiny little good part. Um...
E T H A G R eight is asking Chris, can you run the AFX two DAW on your Orion thirty two plus? I cannot answer you that question because I have no idea what you mean by AFX two DAW. <laughs> it sounds, uh, but I'm sure Antelope Audio can answer you that questions. Uh, Are you going to change to the third generation of the Antelope Audio interface, uh, the Orion 32 Plus, or will you stay with the second generation, Sandro Bardoli? Maybe I need to. Maybe I need to have a little bit brighter screen so I can read better. Um, you know, for what I do, it doesn't really matter if I have generation two or what generation three um, in the DJ setup. It's all amazing. Um, I have to. I have to say that. Uh, this this uh, sound interface is so powerful and has so many features that I'm maybe using 5% only of it. Um, uh, I think this is now the right time for me to dive deeper into this, so I'll do that soon. Until then, I'm just happy to use it. Um, tonight Live asks, is Chris, when you play in Poland, we're waiting for you. Man, I'm waiting to play again too. I'm I'm really I'm really looking forward to play again. But we should first all make sure that we're all safe and healthy. And um, I'm not sure when things are going to starting back up again. Uh, but uh, I'll be playing as soon as it, it's healthy and safe again to do so outside. So you can do your part by still keeping your physical distance um, wherever you are. Just keep your physical distance. And the quicker we get over this, and the, hopefully the we get a vaccine very soon. Um, Thomas Arias is asking, do you master your own tracks? And, well, that is really a good question right now, because I didn't used to. Uh, Brian Sanhaji is a really amazing mastering guy. He works at Kalix Mastering in Berlin, and he's mastering everything that um, uh, is, is somewhat techno-related that I uh, have been releasing on my label CLR, which uh, which I haven't had any releases recently or in the last years. But uh, re remixes that I've done lately, he has been mastering them for me. But I've noticed now, um, sitting on the club mixes for my Burn Slow album, where I have already at the eighth remix now, so I have uh, two more to go uh, to finish the whole album, I have noticed that I'm forming the sound while I'm producing it already in a way where I want it to ha where I want it to be. The function of a mastering person is usually a person that has nothing to do with your track and just completely neutral look ha takes a look at it and puts it into a form which is play more playable or broadcastable, whatever that means. Um, I am experimenting now with the fact that maybe I should stay on top of how my mixes sound, so I'm doing this now. Um, I guess I will release these mixes mastered by myself. You'll be the judge if I did a bad job or a good job. But I'm usually not a good mastering engineer myself. I think I'm a pretty good mixing engineer. I'm, I can mix down stuff pretty well. Mastering is a whole new ball game. Um, but the way I'm mixing down things... Sometimes I feel like I only have to add a limiter and it's mastered because I'm pretty good in looking out for the low frequencies and, 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 and all that stuff. I'm reading more questions of your YouTube feed and I'm switching over to Facebook in a, in a, in a, in a second. Uh, don't worry. I'm sure we have another... So anybody, yeah, if, if you're still interested, I'm sure we have another 15, 20 minutes to do this. Unless I get a message from Antelope Audio that I should st stop talking by now. Um, uh, questions. <laughs> My neighbor was just asking me something, but I should tell him that I'm actually in the middle of a live stream and I can't answer him. All right, let me find some questions again. Uh, PHK is asking, do you still buy and or play vinyl? 
Uh, yes, I still buy vinyl. Um, actually, my last visit to a record store was Hard Wax about three days before the lockdown, uh, and I bought a bunch of vinyls. Um, sitting here in Frankfurt, I usually uh, order the vinyls um, in case they're not available. I either buy vinyls because I really want to have that certain vinyl record, uh, just for me. Um, if I can move my computer a little bit, what I've done in my rave cave here is uh, I actually, because this was kind of a storage room before the lockdown, so I just had everything stored up here uh, that I was using or in, in the in the in the in the time that I was building that other studio below me. So I turned this room into, as you can see, just whatever lockdown room where I make music and draw stuff on the wall. Um, so what I also did is, if you look over what there, <laughs> that's my little record store. I have a little record store with new arrivals, techno, house, various, and my all my vinyls are basically in storage, but I had four big cases which um, I had standing around here, which I'm so happy that I had because I can go there whenever I'm like not inspired. I just go over there and I pretend like I'm in a record store. I'm going through my records, old records, like anything is in there. And I just play it. I have a turntable right here. And um, I'm not using vinyl anymore for uh, for my DJ sets as my setup doesn't really need it. I can do so much with this. Uh, and because doing so much with it, that's why I initially changed from vinyl to playing digital because the possibilities were just far greater. Um, but I still love vinyl, I still buy vinyl, and um, maybe one day I do a vinyl set again. All right, let's see what else. Mm. Hey Chris, where do you miss playing the most? Loving the Alone Together streams. Uh, Fernando Fe is asking that. Yeah, my Alone Together streams, uh, I'm doing every second Saturday basically and the one I told you in the beginning is coming up on Saturday which I'm dedicating to uh, Black Lives Matter and similar organizations so we'll hopefully get a bunch of money together um, in case you want to find the previous streams you can find them on my YouTube channel um, I've uploaded them they were all essentially six hours and longer because I really enjoy playing somehow um, and uh, yeah, I, I miss playing in front of people. That's that's essentially it. Like uh, uh, the interaction is missing. Um, but until we have this, let's do the next best thing. And this is playing from here and broadcasting it out into the into the world. By the way, thanks for telling me you can hear me loud and clear. It would be <laughs> it would be quite funny if I talked all the time and nobody would hear me. Mm -hmm. Hi Chris, if you want to send you some tracks of my own, what is your email for promo stuff? I have an email for promo stuff which is called superpromo, one word, at clr.net. Superpromo, one word, at clr.net. Yet I have to tell you I'm really bad with my emails, but as I told you in the beginning, the right music will always find the way to your ear. Um, Everyone who's producing music out there and hasn't had a release yet and is struggling to get a release and struggling to get the attention of A&Rs or attention of DJs um, to listen to their tracks, um, just keep trying. Keep on doing it. Um, keep on passing out USB sticks. Um, seriously, I, I, I take USB sticks in clubs. I have a bag full of USB sticks. And even though, obviously, put your information on those USB sticks, and even though it's a very slow process, I, at, from time to time, take those USB sticks and go through them. Um, and it might even be a year later after you gave someone your USB stick that he happens to listen to it in the car or something like this. Uh, and it's like, oh, this is an interesting tech. So never stop trying. Don't don't feel like no, oh, nobody's listening, nobody's answering. Most With the amount of music, you cannot answer every email. It's just impossible. Um, but as long as you keep trying and trust um, the fact that if your music, um, if you put your whole passion and, and, and ability into, into music, 
there will be ears who will listen and find it and, and are interested in it. And if even if it's only your neighbors, it's a start. Just like m let the world know that you're making music. All right. Um, Julian Plutter. By the way, I'm just reading questions from YouTube right now. Um, uh, Julian Plutter is asking, Hi Christoph, actually you spelled my rain, name right. What do you think I need for beginning and do some fucking kicks? Um, good thing that you're talking to the professor of kick drums. That's, that's self-titled. Um, I'm crazy about kick drums. Um, that's, that's kind of probably what I've wasted most of my time on in the studio, on the sound of kick drums. Um, it's, it, it, is, uh, it is a science on its own somehow. There is, not, there is not the kick drum. There is not such a thing as the kick drum. A kick drum needs to fit into a track. It, fit, it needs to, to not only tune-wise, it needs to fit in there with all its parameters, like uh, volume-wise, um, decay-wise, attack-wise. There's so many parameters that come to a kick drum uh, that it is quite a science to dive deep into it. I can tell you one plugin which I um, always promote because I just love the company and I'm not getting paid by them. By the way, I'm not getting paid by any of the companies that I'm promoting. I'm promoting those companies because I really strongly believe in their, uh, in their uh, product. I sometimes get uh, free demo um, uh, uh, product of those companies. Um, but I only get that because I want it. So just so you can trust me, if you want to trust me on my on my opinion, um, when it comes to these these products that I'm promoting right here, obviously Antelope Audio. Um, but there is a kick drum uh, 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 plugin by a company called D16. They're a Polish company. It's D slash 16 plugins. If you type that in, you'll find it. And they have a plugin called Punchbox. And um, D16 have two really amazing uh, virtual versions of 808 and 909s, um, which is called Dramasone and Nefeton, I believe. And they have put all the technology into one kick drum generator, which uh, has everything that you basically need to come up with a, with a kick drum. I'm using this plugin very much, uh, but I'm also using old kick drums that I've been using before and I uh, layer them with other kick drums. When you layer kick drums, you really have to be careful about the bottom end. Uh, sometimes you layer kick drums and the bottom end is actually canceling it, each other out. Um, so watch out for this. It's very good to uh, low cut basically maybe one kick drum because you like the attack of that kick drum and you put it on top of another kick drum. Um, I was gonna do a whole different kick drum tutorial on my YouTube site. I've started a little bit tutorials. There's only one so far, but I have another one uh, sort of ready to upload. Uh, I have one on there, um, mastering mixes, uh, basic mastering mixes, um, and I want to do one on kick drums. But when it comes to kick drums, there's so much you can do with it. I mean, if you layer kick drums, it really matters of where the samples are lying. So even if you move it by a sample top forward or backward, your kick drum completely sounds different. Um, so a good start is just playing around with one of these kick drum generators. Um, but it's not, it doesn't really make much sense to work on a kick drum on its own. You need to have a bass behind it. You need to have some sort of groove behind it to make it, to, to know where you want to take the kick drum. Um, alone, the kick drum is kind of like this lost thing somewhere in the middle. All right, let's go. Jay van der Silk is asking, is there a smaller sound card available for your setup, at least six stereo outputs? And no, um, not, not what I'm trying to do because I'm using like uh, uh, essentially 10 outs and four ins. Maybe I'm completely wrong with my numbers right now. Um, but that's something that I wanted to ask Antelope Audio and if Antelope is listening right now, right now, how about you come up with like a small... Orion 32 plus with just maybe 60 channels, which you can pack easier in when you travel. 
um, and which is maybe a little less expensive, you know, just having it for DJs, just an idea. It's just, I'll, I'll, I'll say that publicly here right now. Um, uh, hold on. Uh, more questions. More questions from Facebook. Thank you, Neil. He's monitoring the Facebook chat and get some question there. I'm sorry if I pronounce your name wrong, but Momchil Shizklov is asking me, Hi Chris, can you explain how the Orion influenced the way you play in club environment, as it probably gives you a lot more dynamic range and you can take full advantage of good sound system? Oh, that's a good question. Oh yes. Um, not only it has made me a more confident DJ because I don't worry about crash crashing anymore, um, at least not when it comes to the sound card. Um, it is quite an experience every time. It's not only because of the Antelope Audio sound card, which produces an amazing sound and has this clarity and depth to it that is um, uh, that you can't really find uh, anywhere else in the, let's, let's say, pro-consumer market um, for what we do here. Uh, but the combination with this mixer, which is one of the most high-end analog mixers out there at the moment, um, with beautiful parts being used, um, uh, and with the sub D25 cables, this in connection with the Orion basically gets every sound technician in every club or every um, uh, festival or event the biggest smile on, on their faces. Because when I sound check and I give them the, my signal, they're usually like, what? Um, because it's loud, it's clear, and it's uh, it's pumping. So it, I wouldn't say it has, like, it definitely changes the way you play because you can subconsciously, not consciously, but subconsciously. Um, uh, because when you have the right monitoring, um, which is very important, obviously, because you need to hear what you're doing, um, then you, co you can go into much more layering of stuff, um, much more layering of basses going on with each other. And I, lo I just love bass. And if you have a detailed bass, which uh, the Antelope and the, and the Model 1 is producing, uh, then you can layer stuff so nicely and you can take people on an even deeper journey. So having an amazing sound is definitely giving me way more uh, freedom to venture out into deeper territory, if if you want to say it that way. Um, <clears throat> Hunter Coty is asking, I just got my Orion 32. Congratulations, you've definitely done the right purchase. Is it better to take 32 outs of the Orion into my recording console? I assume you're talking about a digital recording console and return each channel to the 32 ins or just return the main outs of the console. It kind of depends what you want to do with this. Uh, I mean, big part, and I hope that I'm not saying any wrong stuff because I'm not really the most technical advanced person. Um, I, th I think one of the biggest Parts of having a good sound is the conversion between digital and analog. And I hope um, Antelope is not taking me on off the air now because I'm saying anything stupid, but that's my strong belief. And I believe that Orion has like one of the top notches uh, conversions going on ever. So obviously you want to stay away from converting too much. So if you're talking about having an analog desk, um, uh, if you have the possibilities to route, route every ch single channel in, into every single uh, um, thing back without summing it in, in your mixing desk, then summing it in the uh, Orion might be the better and better sounding solution, unless you have a beautiful sounding desk, which then obviously you just go with your um, uh, stereo master out of your desk back into the antelope to convert it back into a digital signal kind of covers both mixers. I'm not sure if I answered your question, though. Um, Neil, if you have any more questions on Facebook, which I'm missing, please tell them to me right here. Uh, I'm going to have a lo another look into, into the YouTube. And I, I would like 
to uh, maybe we'll do another 10 minutes and I'll see what questions are. If you have any questions, type them into YouTube or Facebook um, and I'll try to answer them. Maybe quicker than I've done before. Uh, Nico Masnovo is answering a question that I couldn't answer. AFX2 DAW is available for Orion 32 plus. Maybe someone can explain to me what what the AFX2 DAW is. I I don't know. It it met, it passed me. Do you limit? Uh, yeah, maybe maybe ask me some production questions. I'm happy to answer those or DJ questions, obviously too. But since we're here, Antelope is producing is, is one of the major things. So, do you limit your levels while mixing your tracks, headroom wise? Um, when I mix my tracks on each individual channel, I am actually not using any limits. I am trying to keep the signals uh, loud, but not very loud. That means I'll try to, if you're working on 24 bit, you can, you can easily be below your, your maximum head, headroom and you're not losing any depth of the signal. Um, what you want to try to avoid is going into your, if you're, if you're working inside the box, which I'm obviously doing constantly now. Um, and I, I'm not sure if I'm ever going to go back and get a big mixing desk or anything like this, because Working in the box by now with all the possibilities and tools you have is sound wise probably as good unless you have an insanely expensive um, uh, uh, mixing desk. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm trying to keep my individual channels breathing, um, whatever that might be. Uh, uh, there might be uh, percussion uh, tracks going on, synth tracks going on. If you already limit those, and then you go into your master channel where you ultimately some, limit something too, um, then maybe everything starts to be a bit squashed and you're losing some of the breathiness, the, the air, the depth of your track. Um, when I'm starting to produce or to remix and I'm putting in my first uh, audio files or I'm having some machines running that go through the tracks, I'm always looking at my master channel i'm not putting a limit on my master channel right from the beginning because my master channel should always show me oh it's red well, well you're way too loud because you don't want to get too loud you want to uh, save the loudness and whatever you want to put on your master channel till the very very end of your production um Push it as far as you can. I know it's tempting sometimes that you're in the middle of a thing and you have a loop running and you have some stuff and your master channel is red. Oh, let's just put a limiter on there and it's, it's better. You might lose valuable space and you might end up in the, in the worst case scenario that you basically have to start mixing your own track from the very beginning on. And then you're not even going to get where you were because it sounds so different because you have to start mixing it again because the sound you've achieved with your limit on your master channel is maybe great vibe-wise, but terrible sound-wise. The kick doesn't come through and your vibe is maybe good and you want to recreate the vibe with having a clear sound, it's not going to work. So stay away from this. Um, leave your levels low as possible. Just crank up your headphones or your monitoring uh, to have it loud. And then when you're at a point where you feel comfortable, like, oh, how is the master signal is kind of like, can I work on the master signal? Which I would say is in the, uh, in the last fourth or eighth of your production cycle, which you're going through, like shortly before mixing down your track, you maybe want to go into the mastering thing. I know it's tempting and I do that. I'm, I'm guilty of that of myself, like halfway through, I'll just throw a limit on there just to be able to just play around. But I sometimes regret it. Um, yet I'm always uh, watching it very. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very cautious with that. You save a lot of time yourself uh, for yourself in the end of your production, uh, and and frustration essentially. 
Uh, Tonight Alive is asking, what do you recommend to get started with techno music? Reason or Fruity Loops Studio? I've never really worked with Fruity Loops Studio, but Truncate, our good friend from our DJs and Beers chat, um, he's basically started his career with Fruity Loops and he's made the best tracks on Fruity Loops. It's not essentially um, what you're using, it's how you use it. Um, but when it comes to a beginner, you probably want to start with something that is not that complicated. Fruity Loops apparently is not that complicated to start with, but it has become really professional, I've heard, over the years now, so it's a complicated thing too. Uh, I myself grew up with Logic Pro um, and then mainly switched over to Ableton Live when we were at Ableton Live 1.5. We're 10 now. So I'm really like familiar with Ableton Live. I'm still familiar with Logic Pro. Uh, when I work with Ralph in the studio, we're working with Logic Pro. When I do my own stuff, just because I know it so well, I use Ableton Live. Um, Ableton Live, I think, had um, a good offer to use it for free for, I think, three months. So you can't lose on it. Just download it, play around with it. Ableton Live still, I feel like, is very intuitive and it's easy to work with, so that would be my suggestion, but maybe Fruity Loops is even better. Um, it's all techno music. Hey, is asking, would you take the 303 Devilfish? It's a Devilfish um, uh, 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 Alterate 303. I'm not sure if everybody knows what Devilfish is. Devilfish is a, a very skilled person in Australia who uh, is, I can't come up with the word right now, um, um, retrofitting, is that the word? Uh, 808s, 909s, Roland machines, 303s with extra knobs and extra functionality. Um, he's been doing this for, I think, the past 20, 25 years. And uh, I think Richie is his name. And it's called Devilfish, just Google it. And my 303, which I am a proud owner for 20 years now, I believe, has these extra functionalities. And he's asking, would you take it to, to a club? I have, actually. And I'm always happy to, to, to use it here and there because it's small, you can pack it easily. If I had weekends where I knew I had enough space and, uh, and, and I had a set long enough to, uh, to incorporate into my set, I used to take it. I'm really happy with the combination of, um, of the 909 and 303 in that setup here when I do my live streams because, you know, I'm in my familiar surrounding, nothing can happen, there's no drinks falling on top of it. And since my sets turn, tend to be longer, I take quite some time. Sometimes I just have a really good groove running and then I just add my 303 or 909. I do it sometimes more, sometimes less, just how you feel about it, so how, I, how I feel about it. Um, so absolutely, it's it's such a beautiful machine. It's just it's so good. <laughs> That's a really good question from uh, HPSHT. Uh, how do you think everything now is changing the music industry in the form of selling and releasing music? Well, wow, that's a whole nother show and a whole nother topic, um, which we could do, I think, another two hour show on. Um, I, I think in the beginning of the internet, things kind of went downhill for producers because music was just um, out there, thanks to places like Napster, for free suddenly. And um, in the beginning there was, a revolt against that obviously some of you remember Metallica was suing Napster and uh, uh, they got quite some backlash of their fans because they were like oh you're just too protective about your music um, us DJs we didn't know how to handle this we had DJ mixes on the one hand you had your DJ mixes out you used to sell them on CD and you made some money on it and the labels were making money on it and the producers were making money on it because the tracks were licensed everything was official then suddenly the mixes were just like on uh, iTunes, you could download them on your phone, um, but nobody was paying for this. Um, uh, the tracks, nobody had a track listing, nobody had licensed the tracks. Um, that was not not a good thing for us artists, but then we started thinking, well, at least people hear us, so maybe it's good promotion and you make your money while touring live. Um, so it's kind of a give, it's give and take kind of thing. 
but it made things actually pretty bad in a, in a way. Uh, of course, the promotion for you. I, I remember the early days of the internet. So I'm sounding so old now, um, but in the middle of the 2000s, where where internet was becoming so uh, popular that let's say mixed CDs were ripped and uploaded and downloaded for free. I had my first gigs in Brazil, for example, because people downloaded illegally my my mix CDs uh, that I've released officially. Uh, they downloaded them in Brazil because they couldn't buy them there. They downloaded them. I they 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 heard them. They liked them, and they booked me. So great. That was great. That was a good um, give and take in in that sense. Uh, but the, the the bad part of it is you were not really doing at, at some point any mixities anymore. And then the streaming started and uh, not, nobody pays for anything. So the music industry, basically musicians became beggars because they wouldn't be paid anymore for, for what they released. They were happy to get any cent in their pockets. So what you had to do is you play live. We DJs obviously had a good... Uh, it's good in, in that way because we are playing live all the time. So that, that's a good thing. But for the producers, it was a really sad thing. Um, and uh, I believe we need to change this again a little bit more into the way that uh, producers get paid. Uh, and there's new models now in the Internet, which I really, really find amazing. Uh, there's one called Mixcloud Select, and I've actually recently become a member of Mixcloud Select. Um, and I put up my own channel there. And Mixcloud Select is a platform where you basically pay a fee, a certain fee every month, and you can download mixes. You can download tracks, you can download mixes. Um, and the way it works, there is a software, an algorithm behind it that analyzes all those mixes. Mixcloud has contracts with all those labels. Um, so everyone who downloads a mix there, um, basically pays a certain amount of money for that mix. Um, the mix gets analyzed. Uh, the labels get part of the money. The producers get part of the money. I know it's really, really small and it is a beginning, but it is the right, the step into the right direction again. Because, I mean, the very early days when I was like 16, 17 years old and I had to save a whole week to buy one one maxi single, which is basically a 12 inch, which had basically one club mix of a great track on there. Um, it was pretty insane too, because that was really expensive for one piece of music. It was so expensive because there was so many people involved, distributors, record labels, shops, more distributors, another cha chain of distribution, Everybody wanted to have a, of, of course, the manufacturing. Everybody wanted to have a grab of the of the of the cake. So um, ultimately, maybe if from these ten German marks that I, I paid for Maxi Single, maybe fifty cents were ending up at the producer, and the rest was distributed. So many people made so much money on music back in these days, um, which was too much for a young person to save to buy one record in the end of the month. So we don't want to go back there either. But going to the other extreme that everything has become has gotten for free. And some of you who grew up maybe in the 90s, were born in the 90s or even later, um, probably never had the feeling that music is costing money. You were getting it everywhere for free. You just go online, you download it. Um, uh, until streaming services came like Spotify uh, or Apple Music or something like that, where you maybe then started to become a member because it's so convenient. You find all your music that you had collected at home and on various artists, you have them in one spot. So you kind of became a member of this because of out of comfort. Uh, yet the producers only get like 000. 000. 000. 000. 000.000003 cents for every one stream that, that is better than nothing, I say. All right, better than nothing. But maybe we could get back to a place where music has the right value and uh, which also gives you as the customer a different view on the music. Just imagine how I viewed those 12 inches that I bought back in the days um, when I bought... Let me go over to my record store. Um, maybe I have some old stuff here. Ha! Look at that. Um, 
maybe some of you remember Extempreit, which ein Land, was für Männer. And as a really the biggest hit was Polizisten, which actually you could dig it out because the lyrics are about police brutality again. So this record was an album. An album was like 16 euros. When I bought this, uh, actually this one even came with the 3D glasses and this is the 3D cover. It was released, I don't even remember when. Um, the date is not on here. When I got this, you cherished that because you paid a lot of money for it. You were just like, oh wow, or something like this. Curtis Blow, The Breaks. Um, released on six records, obviously licensed. Um, something like this would be 10 euros. And I was DJing this kind of music too back in the days, in the beginning of the 90s. Um, so you were holding this, you were valuing this piece of music maybe a bit different than now going on a, like on, a, on a site like Beatport, for example, and you just click like, oh, I'll download this or I get this WAV file for one euro 20 or something, and you put it into your system. It's a great piece of music, don't get me wrong, but maybe your idea about that piece of music is different than having this in your hand. Obviously, we're in new times, and I don't want to go back to the old times. Don't get me wrong. I'm not raving about, like, oh, the old times were so much better. But this taught us some sort of different understanding of the value of music. Maybe too much, because too many people were involved. Too many people made a lot of money. And sometimes producers wouldn't even get them get that money because of uh, stupid record labels and stuff like this. Um, but I have the feeling with things like Mixcloud Select uh, and also streaming services, when the the key of distributing the money gets a little bit fairer, that we are on the right track again, that people who make art get paid for this art, people who want to consume this art um, uh, don't overpay on it because there's a lot of people involved who are not actually have to do anything with it. Um, so we get kind of maybe in, in a way where this thing evens out and people are starting to be willing again to pay for music. And that is actually a big step. Yes, I do have a Curtis Blow vinyl. That was just Neil. Um, new, the, um, uh, yeah, uh, why do I have a gener an Orion 32 without a rec mount? <laughs> I don't know if you saw that. Um, let me switch over here again. There. Um, I had to saw them off. <laughs> uh, I had to saw them off because they wouldn't fit in my ha hand luggage um, with the rack mount. So I cut the rack mounts off with a with a, with a um, with a saw. Obviously, uh, I'm sure someone an Antelope Audio was laughing about this. There we go. Um, all right, let me have a last look in your questions here. PHK is asking, did you try playing with stems? Yeah, um, stems is a function of tractor, which you can which you can use stems. Super interesting stuff. Um, uh, it's it's really a lot you can do with it. The thing is, I've never really done it because I am kind of already doing it all the time. Since we have these four decks with Tractor, I am sometimes loading just a loop in one deck. And additionally, because I'm using a machine next to it and effects and sometimes a 303, additionally doing the stems deck um, or the sample decks, they, they call them, I guess, I think would get a little out of hand. There's already a lot of knobs to take care of. And uh, one thing you want to try to avoid when DJing is like not knowing what you're doing. Well, I, I never really know what I'm doing, but you need to know your equipment. You need to know what knob is doing what. And I've never really been a strong believer in layering uh, um, mappings, you know, like, oh, this is the mapping for this, this is the mapping for this. I need to have dedicated buttons and knobs for for this and if I was to use stem decks I would have need to add another controller which at some point is just too much controller and you lose the oversight of music and in the end it's not about how uh, uh, 
the amount of controllers it's 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 more about what you create with it and and i feel like i can create what i want to create with the setup that i'm having now and i can always adjust using a little bit of different effects in a different different way um all right i'll uh, let's let's jump in one last question and we call it a day all right where are we where are we um Well, Alex, let me let me answer your question. That's a good final question because I've talked about it already three times in this chat, but I'm happy to say that again. Uh, hey, Chris, Alex is asking, I saw Paco Asuna and Matador also using the Orion 32 Plus because it works so well with this mixer because both of them are also using uh, the Model 1 mixer. Um, as a DJ myself, what exactly makes this interface so great for DJing? So let me close this talk and this Q&A session by saying A, the confidence as a DJ because you're working with a product that is super reliable. It's, it's, the stability is unbeaten, the sound quality, the depth of the whole thing. Um, it gives you so much confidence to do what you're doing. Uh, when you have good monitoring, um, there is basically the only limit is the sky and what you are able to do and able to achieve sonically in a mix. And this is why I'm so thankful for this nice little company in Sofia, Bulgaria, um, to produce, to make such amazing products. Um, uh, if you ever go to Sofia in Bulgaria, I uh, was blessed to be able to visit their headquarters one time. They manufacture, they promote, they market, they do everything in this one house. And it's just uh, pure bliss to see this all and so much passion is behind uh, what they do and if if you want to do something long term if you want to be successful long term you better have some passion for what you're doing and and you're convinced you're you're you you can share something with the world that um that makes lives better and more fun and with that i thank you very much for being with me for almost one and a half hours um Maybe one day we'll do this again. Thanks Antelope Audio for hosting me. And uh, I would say uh, tune in maybe Saturday for my uh, DJ live stream, the Alone Together live stream, which I will dedicate uh, this weekend to um, uh, Black Lives Matter and to organizations like that. And the more of you tune in, the more the chances are you're gonna hit that donation button that helps the black community, which is hardest hit, not only because uh, of what's going on in this country on a, a racial level, it's also the hardest hit um, uh, with uh, the coronavirus. So there's definitely uh, people in need over there, um, as everywhere. Um, thank you for uh, tuning in and tune in again. So if, if you're with me there, then donate what you can. That's what I wanted to say. Sorry, I just lost my blood. Anyways, it's one and a half hours. I thank you so much for tuning in. And uh, I'll go back to finishing another remix, hopefully. Peace out.